Living with Dangers at Home, next On Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight our program is Ask Anything, uh, where we field your questions regarding any medical concerns you may have. We especially invite questions on the subject of concerns of older viewers. These are two specialists in geriatrics, for example, but they're also hospitalists, so we can talk about intensive illnesses as well. We like talking about dangers of living alone, the impact of influenza and pneumonia, for example, or how we might adjust our lifestyles to resist diseases such as cancer as we grow older. So that's what we want, and we'd love your questions. Okay, so let's test our knowledge on sleep apnea. Try your hand at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's an either or this week. Clues that your partner may have obstructive sleep apnea are either A, snoring, daytime sleepiness, and has spells of held breathing during sleep, or B, has trouble falling asleep and talks in his or her sleep. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, A Picture of Health. I wrote the essays in this book with wonderful accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. But remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answers in. More importantly, we ask for your medical questions. We answer your questions as they're called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email. Joining us tonight are Drs. Fatima Kidvai and Kwabina Kwachi. Both are with the Avera Medical Group Hospitalists in Aberdeen and both are becoming geriatricians and getting their fellowships in geriatrics. So let's start with you, Fatima. You are, tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a, Kidvai is in, not a usual South Dakota name. No, it's not actually. It's not as common in my country too. I was born in Pakistan. Um, I went, my, did my schooling in Pakistan. I did my medical school in Pakistan. And I did about a year of work in Pakistan. What, what uh, general General practice. practice um, our residency is six months of internal medicine and six months of um, surgery, and so, that's what I did. So you did a lot of surgery as well? I did a lot of surgeries. Okay. Appendectomy? Appendectomy, gallbladders, oh, hernias. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So then, after that, you decided that you wanted to come to the U.S. Then I got married, and um, we moved to U.S., and then I did my residency. I did it from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, completed my three years of residency and I've in internal medicine internal medicine and I decided I wanted to be a hospitalist so um, I moved to Aberdeen South Dakota and I've been there for about five years now and I'm loving it I love the people I work with I love the people I take care of it and it's just a great teamwork at my hospital so and during all of this full-time job as a hospitalist you're also traveling to Sioux Falls and working with the, with the, through the School of Medicine, the, the fellowship in, in uh, geriatrics. I am, and I'm loving that too. It's great, and I'm very grateful that, you know, my um, hospital administration allowed me to pursue this opportunity that was uh, presented. And I work a week in Aberdeen, take care of people in the hospital, and the other week um, I come to Sioux Falls and learn to take care of people as they get more experienced in life and accumulate a few years in their life too. Very nicely put. So, so Kobina, tell us a little bit about where you're from originally. Yes, my home country is Ghana in West Africa. Um, we're pretty, pretty close to the Atlantic Ocean. The south border kisses the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I had my med school and everything in Ghana. I finished med school in 2009. No, I finished med school in 2004, and then I worked for about five years, and then and I... And what kind of work practice did you so do? So initially, it was more like um, six months in general surgery, six months in OBGYN, six months in pediatrics, and six months in internal medicine. So that was for two years. And then after I was done, I opted to do something in occupational health. So that is what I was doing um, in my fifth year. And then I said, you know, 
moving forward, I wanted something new. So I tried my hands on the United States Medical Licensing Exam. I did pretty well, and I said, I'm going to apply for residency in the U.S. So at the time, my interest was really in internal medicine. So I just applied, and I was lucky. I got it the first time. And, yeah, you were lucky yeah, because yeah. you were very qualified is what I'm <laughs> sensing. So where did you do your residency? I did my res residency at Harlem Hospital Center in New York City. And um, you can imagine getting to New York City the first time. Lots of people, the culture was different. It took a while to adjust to it, but um, what helped was in my training program, I had friends who had come from my med school. So that was really very helpful, and it went pretty well. It went pretty well. So, uh, and you're, you're married, you're both married. You're married? I'm, you, I'm single. Okay, all right. You're, okay. So, uh, and tell me about what your, uh, and then what brought you from New York City? Well, you could say I always like to try new things out. So when I was finishing my residency, I wanted something new. Um, my family, I have a lot of relatives in New York and New Jersey, but I just wanted something new for myself. So I started looking around. And at the time, I had shortlisted two places to work, one in Branson, Missouri, and then one in um, Aberdeen, which is South Dakota. So I went to those two places. And when I came to Aberdeen, there was something about it that kind of just click with me. And when I went to the hospital I'm working at now, I was impressed with the setup. So I just said, this is where I think I have to be. And then I moved here. And you have also been here five years. I've been here four years. Four years. Four years now, yeah. Four years. So the interesting thing is that you two have a cross reference of specialties that that's different than any that I've ever seen because hospitalists are these intensive people they, uh, they they take care of intensely ill sick people and then they ship them off to these other people like me as an outpatient to take care of them there's this transition that it's oftentimes is not as good as we'd like it to be and um, and then you uh, and also the hospitalists seem to always just are on go green light do everything do everything and then send them away after they've, they've, if they've survived. Uh, has, uh, an, a, a geriatrician is, has that perspective of, uh, that I thought the, the hospitalists have missed. And I just think that this is a special night, that we have a hospitalist that have the perspective of a geriatrician and uh, a very special combination. And I think it is, uh, I, I am impressed by it now, do you agree? I totally agree. I think that's how we were trained and that's how we always thought is that, you know, you treat adults, you get their disease taken care of, you cure it and you send them back. Get and them then, out of the hospital. Well, yes, you get them out. You get them back to where they are from. Right. And then when we started pr practicing, we realized, yes, these are adults, but their needs are a little bit different. You know, for them, just not getting better is the thing. They need to see what their functional status is. Where would they go? Do they need to go home? Do they need to get strengthening? Do they need to go to a rehab? Or is there a place, a new place in a nursing home? Things that we don't think about when we have a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old, you know they're going home. But the strength that an elderly patient has is very different from a strength a 30-year-old would have. Yeah. How they respond to a disease is different. Yeah. And that's something I think we forget when we're taking care of as a hospitalist. And that's what I lacked, and that's why I went into geriatrics fellowship. So. Yeah, wow. Uh, we're going to go to this. Balance is essential to our movement, whether exercising or just moving about the house. Improving our balance may prevent a fall and the potential consequences of falling. Balance is important at every age. Um, whether you are 20, 30 something and you're having a baby, your center of gravity, your center of balance changes with the pregnancy, so it's important for you to be conscientious of the balance at that point. But also as we get older and we age, we know that we get a little bit weaker in our hips and our core. And sometimes with weakness, we get increased risk of falls, especially over the age of 65. Um, and balance is always important. We need balance to help us walk on level ground as well as walking in stairs, and it helps us to continue to be independent in our homes. If you feel like you're falling or you're starting to lose your balance, make sure you mention that to your doctor because one of the, uh, the signs of falling is a previous fall. And a fall does not actually mean you hit the ground. A fall means losing your balance and having to catch yourself on the wall 
or lean up against an object to catch yourself. So just make sure that everyone's aware of the definition of a fall. So it's always important to make sure you have a sturdy surface to hold onto. So whether it's the back of a chair, can I have you come around this way, Carly? So you can hold onto the back of a chair or you can hold onto your kitchen sink or a counter at home, tabletop, something like that. That's about little under waist height, so it's comfortable to rest your hands on there. And a couple of exercises we're going to do. Main thing we're going to do is we're going to work the leg muscles. So your glute muscles as well as your hip muscles. And I really want you just to start by marching. So let's have you hold on right here, Carly. And go ahead and just march. This is very important because as you're walking, you have to use one leg and then the other. So you're building up strength as you stand on one leg, but also as you move the other leg because we need hip strength and glute strength. As you're standing here and as you lift one leg up as you do when you're walking to bring it forward, you have to have strong hip muscles on the side that you're standing on. If you don't have strong hip muscles here, then you don't have the stability in your hips and makes you more off balance. Okay, another exercise you can do is you're going to just kick your leg gently out to the side just a little ways, calling this side kicks or hip abduction, and make sure you do both legs. Another one is hip extension or kickbacks, and you're going to do this gently and just back like this. The important thing is to make sure you stand up nice and tall. Don't want anyone leaning over their chair. And generally we tell patients to do, you know, 10 to 20 repetitions of each of these exercises. Another thing you can do is just having standing with your feet close together and trying not to hold on to anything and see how your balance is. Do this with your eyes open or your eyes closed. If your eyes are closed, it's a little bit more difficult. You can also have, stand one foot in front of the other. Again, when you're doing this, I'd have a chair or something to hold on to. Okay? And again, make sure you do both sides. And if you're going to work on these balance activities, I would have you do it for 20 to 30 seconds at a time, you know, three to five repetitions at a time. It's important to do these exercises every day because if you only do them once in a while, you're not going to get the benefit. But if you do them every day or even twice a day, you're going to get a lot more benefit from these exercises and help improve your balance and if nothing else, maintain the balance you have so you don't go backwards anymore and make it harder for you to live independently. Well, balance exercises are a wonderful idea, and we hope you are all working on this daily. I think exercises, in my own mind, is the, the key. Strengthening is the major reason for falling. Quabina, what? tell me about falling. Uh, this is a geriatric problem, is it not? Yes, it is, and it's very common. Surprisingly, people may not know, but the honest truth is we all know somebody who's been impacted by falling, either directly or indirectly. And I think one thing to notice, as we age, the risk of falling increases. So the risk that you'd fall is higher for somebody who's 85 years of age compared to somebody who's 65 years of age. Well, and if you fall when you're 65, you, you land and it hurts. Yes. You fall when you're 85, you land, you break a hip, 20% death rate. Yes, yes. Um, so what do you think is the most important uh, thing to prevent uh, falling? It's simple things that we can do. I mean, I have to say there are all falls are sometimes not preventable, but most of them can be prevented. Simple things, um, you know, there are so many medications people are on. You have to pay attention to your footwear. You have to pay attention to the lighting in your house, making sure there are no loose rugs in the house, um, making sure, you know, if you need an assisted device, a lot of times what I see is I see, you know, you need an assisted device if a cane. Well, I have one that my husband left behind. Well, your husband's height was taller than you are, so that cane is not really fit for you. You need the right cane. So you need the right cane, and that would prevent your fall. You know. It's interesting to me that the cane is really a proprioception device more than anything else. Now, proprioception is where am I in time and space. So you bounce it off the walls on the floor, you know it's a third leg. It's like your hand when you're walking from the bed to the bathroom, you kind of have a hand on the wall, the couch, the, you know, and it just tells you where you are. So much more important than really the fact that it holds you up. Exactly. And I think something I'd add to this also is, you know, your vision. As we age, we know some eye problems are common. For example, glaucoma 
or macular degeneration. Vision is a big yeah, deal. Vision is a big deal. So it would help to you know have a regular doctor who is also checking your eyes. And if you see that things are beginning to be blurred, you can't really see clearly, especially in the center of your vision, you can't really see. I think you will be necessary to have this discussion with your doctor because there are medications or possibly some types of surgery that can help you and make you see better also. Uh, before we go to the questions, and we've got questions, is you mentioned footwear. I think that's very important. I read an article where they said the worst footwear is bare feet uh, and very close next to slippery socks and that the best footwear is plain old tennis shoes uh, now or running shoes. What, what are you learning now in the, in the most recent literature? Well, I think for sure anything that gives you a lot of contact with the ground is good. Anything that gives you anti-slip properties so you can slip is good. And we know for sure that also if you wear high heels, that is not good. So the base of your shoe or the sole should be broad so you have enough contact with the ground. And preferentially Velcro, something you can just without shoe strings potentially yes. tripping on shoe yes. strings. Yes, yes, also helps a lot. I have to intervene here. If it has to be footwear, it has to be pretty. So instead oh. of wearing ten <laughs> heels, you should wear, you know, something that is stable. So maybe so a thicker heel. Can would you have be. a thicker, pretty heel? Of course you can. You okay, all right. All so. right. So says the lady, you could. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. So we had a question from. Um, the Iowa, Iowa last week, she tried to call in. She got the SDSU, SDSU sent her to the Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce sent her to, uh, and on and on. And finally, we got her question. It was about aortic aneurysms uh, and smoking. And so uh, we did talk about smoking and aortic aneurysms uh, and its association. Any words of advice that you would like to give this woman about it? Well, smoking increases your risk of getting aortic aneurysms. And at this point in time, the recommendation is for, especially in males who have a history of smoking, 65 years or older, you should talk to your doctor about getting just an abdominal ultrasound to see if you have that risk. We know that that risk is higher in men than women. And the smokers, definitely. Yes, and you know, smoking, quitting, to, quitting smoking at any age is helpful. Is helpful. The other issue is that you, until it ruptures, you may not feel it. Yes. And then when it ruptures, you've got this amount of time before you, you, you're going to die. Definitely. So Definitely. Uh, it's one of those things, that's the one screening test that these people that move from town to town. I would say get the abdominal a, uh, aortic ultrasound. That's the one that you should do. And I do think that, and if you can select it, just do that one. Uh, uh, particularly if you're a male, and have smoked. Yes. And one time screen is, uh, is enough, yes. uh, and if, but unless it's abnormal. 82-year-old yeah. man from Sioux Falls recently put on a thyroid medicine and I'm experiencing weight loss. Is this normal? Are there other changes I might uh, encounter on medicines? So weight loss on thyroid, do you see that happen? Um, unfortunately, we do see that happen, and um, it could be because that medication may be too high for him. So when they're started on medication, thyroid medication takes a longer time to act, so it's not going to act in a few days. Um, that's why you have to recheck the thyroid hormone level, and that's usually in six to eight weeks that you'll know that your medication is appropriate. So the first thing I would really advise is that um, he needs to talk to his primary care physician they can get a simple blood test and that would tell them if his dose needs to be lowered down. Right, but do you think that it's thyroid medicine? It, that could be? It could, could be, be, but there could be other reasons that we really have to talk to the primary care physician about. Yeah, so I, just putting it on one medication yeah, may not be appropriate. No, you gotta look at other things too, yes. right? Yes, you would, you'd, you'd screen for every other problem and yes. you know, underlying hidden cancer of some kind, yes. not to scare that person, but to, you know, just have a good, careful workup. Yes. Right. See a geriatrician. <clears throat> so here, would, a, uh, would you recommend an 80-year-old with pancreatic cancer and liver meds have palliative chemo? Corbina. Well, um, the goal of palliative chemo, like it says. Palliative meaning yep, to make it easier for you. Exactly, make it comfortable. So if that is what the goal is, to make you comfortable, it will be okay to consider palliative chemo. Um, because the other option with if you don't get the palliative chemo is probably you may have side effects related to growth of the tumor. 
either in the pancreas or wherever it is, sick in, in other organs. The palliative chemo can potentially buy you a little time, just a little time, make you comfortable. Right. But the goal of palliative chemo is not to cure. It's right. to make you comfortable and probably enhance your quality of life towards the end. Right. But that said, I think we should remember that it does have side effects. So would you rather probably be comfortable as you are or be subject to the side effects of chemo, like you know the nausea, the vomiting, right. that not feeling well. So these are things you know you should probably consider and have a frank discussion with your oncologist. Yes, your oncologist is going to know. Yeah. The, the the problem is sometimes the oncologists are quite aggressive, and if you're 82, a person could say, well, just let it be. And sometimes you know that 82 year old guy has an 82-year-old cancer that's just going to sit there. Yeah. I've seen 82-year-old people who had, I had an 80, I had a 85-year-old woman come in with an abdominal mass. We opened her up. We found widespread ad ad adenocarcinoma, probably of the walls uh, or the per uh, omentum or something. But we debulked it as much as we could. We closed her up. We put her in hospice. And the long story is, 10 years later, she died of heart failure. You know, it, you, it's 82-year-old uh, cancer. You don't know what's going to happen. So it's a come see, come saw. You've got to trust your oncologist, but I'd also go to your internist and say, what do you think? And then it's important to discuss what does he really want? Right. You know, what does, what's his goal? Does he want to spend those last days or last years with the family, be comfortable, enjoy them? Or a lot of time when they get chemo, their blood counts drop, so they are more prone to infection. They do end up in the hospital with a lot of infection. Right. And so if they might be spending more time in the hospital than they can with things that may be really important to them. That's a, like you say, a really good discussion with your oncologist. Absolutely. 82-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, horse for six weeks, diagnosis of acid reflux. Pain in the stomach and chest doesn't believe this is the case. Explain why it might be reflux. Yes, so reflux means that you are backing up acid from the stomach where it's normally supposed to be up the tube that connects the back of your throat to your stomach, which is the esophagus. And when that gets to your throat, it can irritate your voice box, or what we call the vocal cords, and give you that alter, altered um, quality to your voice. Right. So it is possible that, yes, it is reflux, but there should be other things you look out for also. Right. Maybe a sour or metallic taste at the back of your throat, or maybe frequent awakenings at night because you have heartburn. Right. Or maybe you notice that you have discomfort at the back, just beneath, behind your breast um, bone or in your belly when you take hot or spicy foods. These are things that can probably bias your mind that the change the quality of, of your voice is related to the acid reflux. So don't just take it in isolation. It should be with all these things we talked about, but it is possible. I like the idea of non, uh, I, I mean, I think that this person would be immediately on a meprazole by me, I mean, yes. uh, uh, Prilosec. Uh, but uh, don't forget, elevate the head of the bed, put four and six inches of uh, books underneath the bedstead. Don't eat a big supper. You make an early light supper and nothing afterwards and maybe a, a gulp of Mylana before you hit the sack and sometimes that can do more than all of that medicine. And, yeah, and one more thing, cut down on the caffeine. That yeah. helps too. And here's, here's looking at you, friend. So you're right, if that is a problem, certainly caffeine, particularly after noon, they say. And don't eat, don't eat pizza late at night. Pizza yep. late don't. is an absolute yeah. night. 69-year-old <laughs> woman from Mobridge caller has congestive heart failure. What causes it and what are the best techniques to take care of it? Um, congestive heart failure is, there are basically two types of congestive heart failure. Either your heart's not able to relax enough, so it's not a, it pushes the fluid back into the lungs, or your heart is weak enough that it becomes dilated and it just cannot propel all the blood through your whole body. So again, it backs up into the lungs. Um, symptoms that can happen with congestive heart failure is you get short of breath. Um, initially, you get short of breath when you're moving around. Then with mild activity, that can get worse with moderate activity. Um, you would notice that you have swelling in your legs. They start getting puffy. Um, and it could be coronary disease, it could be sleep apnea, it could be... It 
could be a multiple high blood things. pressure lots of causes and the main treatment real quick um, a lot of doctors would give you water pills but for your end cutting down salt okay. not adding any salt in your food um, not pushing fluids not pushing fluids stay within the recommendation whatever your doctor says and be compliant with the medications yes. Your blood pressure medications are very important. Take them as directed. If you feel that you're having a breathing problem or you stop breathing at night, getting checked up for sleep apnea is a very bit important thing too. 83 year old woman from Sioux Falls, caller has recurring bladder infections but has been on so many antibiotics that she's ruined the normal flora in her digestive tract. What can she do about this? I'll say that my OBGYN partner friend, Rich Goodvangen, would just say this probably isn't a bladder infection, it's vaginitis. Mm -hmm. All the antibiotics have just made the vaginitis worse. It gives you the burning feeling and your problem is only worsened by antibiotics and that you should be put on a BioGia tablet by mouth and that vagina and maybe an, a test of your vagina to make sure that's okay and or maybe there is an infection and there's a leak between the, infect, the bladder and the GI tract and then it goes on and on. So you need to be very carefully worked up sometimes when this is not working. Yes, I agree. And you know, good news is we do have people who have the knowledge and expertise here in Sioux Falls. You know, one specialty would be maybe urology or gynae urology. That specialty would help. And like you said, it might not always be the so-called infection. It might just be because you have some atrophy of your vaginal mucosa. Right. That can irritate you and make it look like you have a urinary tract infection because it burns, because it hurts, and just right. maybe Topical estrogen cream might be the way yeah. to go. A topical estrogen cream. Um, I've got a question. 82-year-old uh, will have tooth pulled. Dentist will use 2% lidocaine, 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. What medication should I or the dentist be aware of for possible cross-reaction? That's a good question. Fatima. <laughs> going to get epinephrine and going to have lidocaine. Any, any particular medicines that you'd be... Uh, or conditions you'd be worried about? I think it's really important that uh, the dentist should have a whole list of your medications. You know, just one medication, one versus the other is not going to be. They need to know all the medications that you're on. Those medications not just reacting with these medications, but those re medications reacting among themselves. A big one on those would be being on medication for osteoporosis. That is something they need to be aware of. And the other thing that dentists need to be aware of, if you've ever had infection of your heart called endocarditis, or if you have a valve replacement, um, they need to be on medications. These are the new recommendation that only those two conditions are what they need medications the, the for. Astro, the osteoporosis drugs, uh, the, the group is, what does it call it? Uh, the bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates, like, what's the classic? Um, so then, I, I know just the, the generic. The, yeah, so the the, the uh, bisphosphonates. Yeah. Sometimes you you can get necrosis of the jaw. Of, uh, the jaw so yeah. you've got to be careful. But generally, mm -hmm. my answer on that question would be they're, they're it's pretty real. safe. Yeah. They're very safe. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, each week we give you an update on the influenza cases in South Dakota. Earlier today, I had a chance to visit via Skype with the state epidemiologist, Dr. Lon Keitlinger, about the status of influenza and, and some other health concerns as well. We welcome Lon Keitlinger, the state epidemiologist for South Dakota. Thank you for joining us, Lon. Thank you, thank you. I'm in here and I'm in the basement of the Public Health Laboratory, so glad to talk great, to you. Great, great, great. Let's talk about the flu this year. How are we doing in this state? We're, it's slow, it's really slow, but it's picking up. Uh, this is the slowest and mildest influenza season we've had uh, in 13 years. Uh, but the, the virus is out there, it is making people sick, but it just is not sweeping across uh, the state and making a lot of people sick. Last year we had a bad year, but this year it's uh, been pretty mild so far. Can't predict what's gonna happen after the next couple of weeks, but so far it's been pretty mild. What do you think about the rest of the country? Have they had a mild flu season as well? Yeah, you know, overall it's been mild. And But just in the past week or two weeks or, or, or so, some states have been um, reporting uh, severe cases of influenza in a few cases. So uh, the virus is uh, hitting some people somewhere, but so far in South Dakota, we haven't had any reports of this severe, difficult to treat influenza. Right, that, 
So we hope that stays away from us. Do you think that's because the flu is lighter this year everywhere, or is it because of all the vaccinations we've been doing? Well, for us, it's two things. We have, uh, you know, as I'm proud to say, we have the highest influenza vaccination rate in the country, so that certainly helps. But we've also got some old viruses circulating. Nothing new on the on the viral platter this year. Uh, and what the predominant strain is is good old H1N1, and that's been around for seven years. And so people are building up immunity to it. Um, people are still getting sick, but it just doesn't seem to be hitting people as hard this year as it has been in past right. years. Now, I don't know what the next couple of weeks are, 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 are going to bring. In fact, tomorrow on Friday, we, we uh, do our weekly flu report, and we're, we're ratcheting South Dakota up a notch. We're going up to regional activity status, and that's the second highest. So we're, we're going up with, with influenza activity in South Dakota. But even so, it's it's been pretty mild so Too late far. for the flu vaccine well it's almost march but no you know the the party line is if if the outbreak hasn't hit yet you're not too late but good grief rick you know we need to be getting our shots back in september and october because we really don't know when influenza is going to hit us we just you know don't know we can't predict the week or even the month you know as we're seeing this year what are your recommendations about the pneumonia vaccines, Prevnar and Pneumovax? Absolutely, get them. You know, just it, the, the pneumonias, they cause a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of illness uh, in people, and we recommend that you get it. Don't, don't hesitate, uh, just go in and get right. it. Right, and I'm recommending to my people over 60 or 65, and anyone who has lung disease or diabetes, that they get the Pneumovax and then a year later get the Prevnar vaccine or vice versa. But they should get both of those shots a year apart. So what's about the Zika virus? Any, any new changes or new reports? Well, okay, here's another example of an emerging viral disease, a mosquito-borne virus. Uh, Zika, it's actually a very close cousin of West Nile virus, which we in South Dakota have had you know, we become well acquainted with. But the difference is Zika is carried by the tropical, the Egyptian mosquito, and we don't have that here in South Dakota. And I don't think it's ever going to come and live here if the climate stays the same here. But um, we do have people that travel. We have South Dakotans that travel to Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, parts of South America. And uh, it's making people... It, Actually, the disease itself is milder than West Nile. With Zika, you don't have the encephalitis, you don't have the meningitis, you don't have the deaths and the hospitalizations like we see here in South Dakota every summer. But what's bad about Zika is it has been linked, strongly linked, uh, to birth defects. And um, I guess the one that's been in the news the most is um, microcephaly, babies born with uh, uh, very small heads. And that's what makes Zika so scary. And we've had cases. Is it because of travel or because of sexual transmission? What do you th know about that? We've had cases in, in the United States, but not acquired in the United States. It's been uh, cases among people who have traveled to the Zika zones, you know, most places in the Caribbean, Mexico, and South America, and then they've come back. In South Dakota, we've tested a couple dozen people now, mostly pregnant women, who have traveled, and uh, none of ours have come back positive yet. I see that Minnesota and Nebraska, our neighboring states, have had um, positives, but that doesn't mean it's transmitting there. In fact, we do not expect it to be transmittable in South Dakota or any of the northern states. This uh, Egyptian mosquito, it is found in um, uh, Florida, in Texas, Louisiana, uh, parts of California, Hawaii, some of the hot states, but not not this far north, so we really do not expect local transmission. Are there other issues that we should talk about as far as public health in South Dakota? Oh, gosh, there's there, there's so many issues, Rick. I guess we could just talk for hours on them. Um, some of the things that we're working on, you know, that we're perpetually working on are like the obesity outbreak, uh, tobacco, uh, cancer, uh, getting people more active, um, just lots of different issues, keeping our vaccination numbers up, um, like the meningococcal vaccine that will now become uh, a middle school vaccine in South Dakota. The legislature just passed that, so we're uh, pleased to have that. Um, 
you know, we've, we've, we've got our old standby diseases that we're always fighting. And then things like Zika, you know, that just comes literally out of the blue and we have an emerging virus. A year ago, I would have had to go, go to my books back here to find even the, the smallest little half sentence paragraph on Zika virus. And now, you know, we're, we're, we're just spending all kinds of time on it and um, effort on it. So. Vaughn, do you have any take home messages for the public? I guess since influenza has been so unpredictable and that's what we started this talk with, I just wanna remind people that influenza, even though we're, we're, we're getting close to March now, it's still a threat. Wash your hands. If you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, you know, you've still got a chance to do it, even though it's late. And if you're sick, stay home. We've got lots of other respiratory diseases out there. We're having spikes now in RSV, uh, which really affects children. Um, stay home if you're sick, wash your hands, use the hand gel, take care of, your, take care of yourself. Uh, I, I guess that's our, our recommendation for this week. Thank you for joining us, Lon, and take care of yourself. Thank you, Rick, thank you. Well, that was great uh, to hear from Lon and that, that nice interview this afternoon, for, or this morning, actually. Uh, you know, he talked about the value of uh, other issues, you know, like exercise. Uh, and it's, again, I want to em emphasize the thing that you said earlier, the value of exercise in helping prevent falls. And that's probably the biggest danger for these people, that, uh, the elderly. That, so if they can stay in shape, they can prevent a lot of problems. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And I think the exercises, the exercises you go into should target improving your gait, your balance, and strength also. If you did either of these without combining them, you may not get the benefit. It should be something that would improve your strength, gait, and balance. So, and, and walking is one of the, the major, yes. major yes. ones. Okay. 82-year-old yes. man from Selby, does Medicare pay for shingle shot and where can it be obtained? I think it does, doesn't it? I think it does too. If I remember correctly, it's pretty expensive. I think it was two hundred and twenty dollars when I had mine. Yes, I think they're beginning <laughs> to cover, and um, the recommendation is, you know, sixty-five years or older, you should get a shot. So you talk to your primary care provider, yeah. and they will help you. The biggest thing with the shingle shot is it helps protect, especially against the pain that comes after the shingles, infection is gone. Right. It's pretty protective of that. So 50% reduction in, in shingles and 50% reduction in the pain or something like that. That's about 60% reduction. 60, yeah. Right. Yeah. 78 year old woman from Sioux Falls, floating feces. What is the cause and possible issues associated with this? Is a dietary explanation likely? I love that question. <laughs> uh, what do they say? Um, um, heavy, 40-ish, female with floating feces, and um, there's other Fs in there, but uh, the, the question is, what does that indicate? Female 40. It could be any problem. Um, floating feces mean that your fat is not being absorbed in your stomach, and that's why it's coming out as a feces, and it's not being able to flush easily and floating. It could be issue with your gallbladder. It could be issue with your pancreas. It could be a medication that you're taking that you're not absorbing that. Um, talk to your doctor. They might run some tests on you just to figure out what's going on and um, go on from there. And nutrition, um, there's a way that you change the type of fat you're consuming. You might not be breaking down one type of fat and you have to change your diet. I, I would ask the, the caller if she is taking um, okay. uh, fish oils tablets. The other is uh, something about the amount of air that you're swallowing and it, the air in the, in the, in the, the uh, stool. In fact, I remember an article about it and they said that's the classic thing for gallbladder disease, but it doesn't really mean much. Right, but other things need to be looked at, so that's the Get important panel thing. B. Uh, do your guests have suggestions on how an elderly person can remain at his home or her home alone until death? I'm 85, my wife is in her 80s. We dread the day when one of us will be alone. We also dread the idea of living in an old people's home. What's your comment? Well, um, I guess, like they rightly said, everybody wants to age 
and age appropriately in their homes to help so you stay in your home i guess the biggest thing is to have good health having good health means that you want to have a regular follow-up with your doctor if you have multiple medical problems you want to make sure you're taking your medications too don't neglect exercise do exercise inevitably we don't say it it won't happen it will happen you might lose your spouse but having people support around also that would help you pull through that time it's important so you don't slip into depression because depression will result in functional decline which can make you go to a nursing home so i'm guessing my advice to these folks would be stay healthy enjoy life follow up with your regular primary doctor and let's see how it goes that exercise idea and if you lose your spouse Draw in other social, make, yep. make new friends, yep. you know, yep. uh, find another girlfriend or a boyfriend, you know, those <laughs> things. I mean, they, you know, yeah. and most of them will say, oh, uh, one's enough for me or whatever, but 72-year-old woman, for, I love that advice, and I like the advice about exercise. I think that that's probably the most underrated and most important of all things that we can do to stay functional into our elderly. Now, do you disagree with me on that? No, absolutely. Exercise, being happy is the way to live long and be healthy. Making sure your house is safe is also another thing. So you might have to make some adjustment to your house. You might need to have bars in the bathroom so you don't fall. You might have to make accommodations so you can take away any hazards that might make you fall. So. Not, a, not a bar that has scotch or... or uh, no, not that, not that kind of, of bar. <laughs> okay, 72-year-old woman from Mitchell has thyroid tumors all over her body. What is causing these and what can I do about them? I suppose those are probably fatty tumors, not fibroid tumors. Yeah, yeah. So how dangerous are they? P pretty benign. I think it's just cosmetic. And um, because it's multiple, it might be difficult to deal with. Um, it would help if she would maybe talk to maybe a plastic surgeon, see what they can take out. But if it's multiple, likely might not be anything you can do. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people I've taken care of who have lipomas yeah. or lipomata, which is multiple fatty tumors. Mm -hmm. And I have a functional fatty tumor, mm -hmm. which is a fatty tumor you can feel on my back. I have my patients rub it and they go, oh my God, you've got one too. And I go, and it's functional because it's just taught you that I haven't done anything about it. Leave it alone is yeah. what I generally say. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes if they're in a spot that they're causing you pain, you know. Or they're horrendously ugly. I see a guy who has a big one on his neck. He had that, I had him remove it, you know. Right. There are times to get rid of them. Yeah. Exactly. Those are the times to get rid of it. But, you know, if it's more cosmetic reason, you know. And there's the thought the that it might be not a fatty tumor. If you have nodules in your neck, lymph nodes in the neck, that uh, you know, watch those carefully. If they're yes. growing, yes. let's get them biopsy. 80-year-old yeah. yeah. from Redfield is still having hot flashes. 80 hot flashes. She does have her ovaries, but does not have a uterus. Any suggestions to help her? Wow, 80, 80 and hot flashes is pretty rare because you have gone past um, menopause. I would worry a little bit about ovarian tumor, okay. don't yeah, you think? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's possible. It's secreted, yeah, if you have tumors that are secreting hormones, you know, normally it's a deficiency of the hormone which causes the hot flashes. So, so, but, it, so if there's, you know, exactly. generally you're done by 80. You are. You should be done you should by be. 80. You should be. Um, sometimes they can be delayed if you had been taking hormones that was practiced earlier on, that people who were going through menopause, they yeah. were put on hormones. So yeah. yes, your hot flashes would be delayed. But 80 is still a little late. I always worry that it might have been uh, night sweats or low-grade fever like tuberculosis or uh, other kinds of, of, uh, of abnormal uh, fever causing, low grade fever causing things, S subacute bacterial endocarditis or lymphoma, or there's a list. So you really need to check, check that one out. Uh, someone from Lebanon, South Dakota, 65, has an essential tremor in his dominant hand. His primary provider has told him it's fine to leave it alone. He's mentioned that they could try blood pressure medicine that might help. We're wondering what the experts suggest. If he's right-handed and it's impairing his quality of life and the things that he do, then he needs medication. They might be helpful. Right, and, and a blood pressure, propranol, yes. blood pressure, old blood pressure medicine, yes. I mean, and all of the beta blockers seem to help that. And then there's also 
a, uh, a seizure medicine that can help. What's the name of that? I'm trying to. Primidone. I think Primidone. 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 Yeah. Uh, but then th that one slows you down, and the beta blocker kind of slows you down. And sometimes it's better to just live with the, tr with the tremor. Yeah. yeah. Depends you, on how pronounced they are yeah. for the showman. If they're just mild, that you can you don't notice it, but you know that it's there, then we don't have to do anything. But like I said, if you're writing a check and it doesn't make sense because it's shaking so bad, okay. medications are out there. They can be helpful. Trial and error. Trial That's and it. It doesn't look like he's on any medication, so he stands a pretty good chance of getting up to a 50% reduction in the the magnitude of the tremors if he goes on medication. With and you're talking propranolol yes. your first call. Yes. Yes. 81 year old woman, 87 year old uh, Sioux Falls is difficulty having. Is more difficult to have cataract surgery while the caller currently has glaucoma. I don't know the answer to that. Do you? It's tough. I don't. I don't also know. Do you uh, know? Uh, eye doctors are the best people too. Uh, I, I don't know the answer either. So, <laughs> we we have to admit we don't know the everything. Almost everything. <laughs> Seventy-five-year-old woman from Sioux Falls lost balance while leaning forward. Is this just a lack of balance or something more sinister? Well, um, it depends if she had any associated symptoms. If she was dizzy or anything of the sort, I'd say maybe something else. But if you lost balance leaning forward, might be because you have a problem with balance. In which case, probably you should talk to your doctor and get a more comprehensive testing of your balance to exactly know what's going on because there might be something else also going on. There's things that can happen in the brain. There's a time yes. to do uh, like the MRI and those kinds of things. But then there, you know, that's an excessive $3,000 test and it may not be completely paid for, so you have to consider it. Yes. Just a little balance, a lot of people have a little balance problem leaning forward. Yeah. That's, that's true, that's true. It, but like Dr. Kwati said, it all depends when that loss, loss of balance was associated with something else. You were dizzy, you were flushed, you were having ringing in your ears, the room was spinning. All, it, 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 it all depends, so. good, good answer. Uh, Dr. Kidvai, what kinds of medicines are there available to a patient suffering from hemophilia in South Dakota? Hemophilia. Hemophilia. Do well, you know the answer to that? Well, I think the best way would be maybe talk to a hematologist. They are, it's, it's when your blood is really thin, you can't clot, you bleed. So there might be, you know, things that are genetically, you know, made to help so you don't bleed, but I think the best bet would be to talk to a hematologist. Right, and they're transfusing these yes. people with these, the, the, the product that yes. gives them back their factor that yes. they need for bleeding. 81-year-old woman, quickly, inward to Iowa, using generic Ambien to sleep for quite a while, five to 10 milligrams nightly, heard it's not good for the long-term health of your heart and brain, is this true? And if so, what do you, uh, how do you get off of it? Ambien is a medication that came out only to be use, used as needed for sleep. All these medications do increase the risk of you falling. So we try to stay away from any medication that increases your risk of falling. Very addictive. Very Causes addictive. depression. Yep. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking. It give you dreams. You can sleepwalk. So it, those medications are not the safest. However, if you've been l using them for a long time, slowly tapering them off. And then there are other alternatives you can use. Melatonin, which is produced by our brain, sometimes is a good alternative. But having a good sleep hygiene is much better than using any other medications. Right. Yep. And I think if it's been going on for quite some time, you have to talk to your doctor. You're, uh, you have to taper, too. And yep. don't, it's very hard to get off. So give yourself three months and get off of it. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Clues that your partner may have obstructive sleep apnea are either A, snoring, daytime sleepiness, and has spells of held breathing during sleep, or B, has trouble falling asleep and talks in his or her sleep. The correct answer is A. And it was Ruth Hulsebus who, of Brookings, hello Ruth, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Ruth, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. You still feeling lousy, sweetheart? Terrible. Day four of aches, chills, sweats. Oh, poor thing. You're just not you when you have the flu. I don't feel like me at all. Do I look sick? You look different. Oh, you're so sweet. Mm. That's not your pretty face. Feel like yourself. Get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. 
Occasionally, I awake early mornings around 3 or 4 with the clock staring at me, my mind churning away at some inappropriate, repetitive, and unfixable, even in the light of day, dilemma. D.D. Barrett wrote of typical early morning feelings. I've got a bad case of the 3 a.m. guilts, replaying all those things I didn't do right, filled with regret, depression, and self-loathing. While almost everyone has that occasional night of unfixable guilts and poor sleep, 10 to 15% of adults have way too many of them. The diagnosis of insomnia can mean trouble falling asleep or early morning awakening and not being able to get back to sleep. Usually, sleeplessness results from some underlying cause. One study from Minnesota indicated that up to 80% of those with regular early morning awakening have depression, anger, personal loss, or post-traumatic stress syndrome. But insomnia can come from long-term medication and drug effects or withdrawal, especially with tranquilizer or ambient-like sleeping pills or alcohol, decongestants, amphetamine-like meds, or late coffee. Insomnia can result from physical or medical illnesses like asthma, arthritis, or even sleep apnea and deconditioning. Also, shift work, change of timing for sleep schedule due to travel, job change, or simply aging can mess up your sleep habits too. And sometimes there's no reason at all. Now that's a long list. The most important point, a sleeping pill should be the last thing for which to ask. Avoid the ambient type tranquilizers if possible as they can paradoxically worsen the problem, especially depression and dependence. Over-the-counter sleeping pills lose effect after a few days. Better medication options, if absolutely needed, would be in the antidepressant or melatonin categories. Instead of pills, one should try all the non-medicinal options first. Plan consistent awakening and sleeping times, even through the weekends. Get exposure to bright light or sun in the morning. Reduce stress and clutter. Make the bedroom a happy, cool, dark, non-TV space. Do sequential breathing and relaxing exercises. Get off or reduce alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco. And my favorite recommendation would be to get into a morning or afternoon regular exercising program, like walking one mile or 12 blocks every day. And finally, if nighttime snoring, snorting, obesity, restless legs, or daytime sleepiness is a problem, you might have sleep apnea. So ask your care provider to schedule a sleep study. Miguel de Cervantes wrote of sleep, it's the meat for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and sets the king and the shepherd, the fool and the wise man, even. May we all find our way to sleep through those unfixable 3 a.m. guilts. I sincerely want to thank our wonderful guests, Fatima Kidvai and Kwabina Kwachi, for volunteering to join me tonight in answering the great questions from you at home, our viewers. And I want to thank all of you at home for inviting us into your living rooms. We sincerely appreciate it. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Hello and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. We had many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of our show. Let's get started. And I wanted to ask, what's the name of your children? 
uh, Fatima. My older one is Hamza and the younger one is Suleiman. They're so, 16 and 14 now. Shout out to those kids. Hi, <laughs> they're here for debate, so they're enjoying it. Oh, really? So, yeah. Great. So uh, let's get started. 63-year-old <clears throat> woman from Sioux Falls. Mother is 95, Alzheimer's, poor balance. Doctor suggested a walker. But is this really appropriate if she may forget what to do with it? Good question. It is a great question, and it's very important. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, yes, it is important that she takes that walker. That's the one that's preventing her from falling. Yes, she may forget to take it most, you know, some of the times, but we just have to keep her reminding and um, encouraging her and telling her she needs to use it. Good answer. 80-year-old uh, woman uh, from Sioux Falls. Oh, that's the one we just asked. 80-year-old woman from Edgerton, Minnesota. Caller's 84-year-old husband diagnosed with trachea, chronconia, malacia, or trachea malacia, as I would understand. Mayo experts said airway is collapsed 90% collapsed on the right side and 80% on the left side. So they said there is very little they can do for this. Are there any suggestions from the doctor? He was, he was perfectly healthy before this. So he's got trachea, malacia, and he's got lots of collapse, and he's 84. I think, unfortunately, there might be very little you can do. Um, trachea malacia means that the support structure of the trachea is gone. So it just falls in on itself. So it will be very hard. Unfortunately, sometimes if it's higher in the airway, you can bypass it with a trach, but if it's extensive and lower down, then there may be very little you can do. And very the causes little. for it? Where you have um, the support structure, the collagen that opens the tubes up, right. goes away and they just collapse. For any reason? I mean, radiation perhaps? Or? The ones I've, I've heard of, typically idiopathic. You don't, you don't know what causes it. Something we have some type of caustic burn, inhalational injury, or something of the sort. But um, the ones I've heard of, like normally idiopathic, there's no reason. Idiopathic meaning we don't we know don't what the heck what, it is. What happened? Yeah. 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 You have anything to add about but it? But this may not be a time to take it as as depressing as the diagnosis is. This may be a time to enjoy and say, what are our goals in life? What are our priorities in life? How can we make the best of whatever time we have? Whatever the things he, it's important for him. There are some unfinished business he wants to take care of, enjoy children, enjoy friends, hasn't talked to some friends for a long time. These may all be the time that we have to cherish whatever time he has and enjoy them. You know, we, I don't think we think about that enough. I mean, I think we are all stuck in this, <clears throat> I'm going to live forever mode. Yeah. And we don't savor the moments that we do have. He, yeah. They're in their 80s. Yeah. He's in his mid-80s. He's had a great life. Yeah. Let's t I mean, it's sad that he, there's an illness, but let's take the time that he does have and let's make it the best it can be. Yeah. Make new memories, absolutely. New memories. A 72-year-old woman from Mitchell, caller is also has red spots all over her body and was told these were symptoms of a toxic liver. Hmm. Red spots, toxic liver. So I, probably my mind is going to, is it cirrhosis with what we call the technical term spider telangiotasis, or which is to say you have these small blood vessels which are flush, so you can see them. You press, it goes away. Right. You take the pressure and it comes back And the again. spider, yep. the spider telangiectasia. Yes, yeah. yeah. so I don't know if that is what she's asking, because yeah. those ones can be on your face, can be on your chest, can be on your belly, or on your back as well. So I see it for other reasons, though, too. Or it could be patiki. It could be some problem with the um, one of the cell in the blood that is not clotting. Mm -hmm. If that is low, then it can cause breakage of the small vessels and you would have these red spots on your legs or other places in the arms too. Mm -hmm. And that might be very different from a liver disease too. You so. could have familial telangiectasia, which is just an inherited thing that comes up. Sometimes it's in the GI tract. Yeah. There's a lot of different causes. There's a lot of there different is. causes. Again, may not be the liver. May not. Exactly. May not. So unless you talk to your doctor who gets a good history, rules out everything, you need some blood work done, yeah. that would be beneficial. That's good. 75 year old woman from Delmont. Vitamins and supplements, are these necessary or harmful or good? Multiple vitamin B6, B12, fish oil, CoQ10, melatonin, Prevastatin. Uh, Prevastatin isn't a, isn't a supplement. Avocado oil, aspirin a day, D3. What do you think of those ideas? I think if you're eating healthy, we're getting our nutrition from our diet, we're eating our vegetables, we're eating our fruits. You don't um, need these all multivitamins have not been shown to be any beneficial or give us the energy that we think we do. Actually, they increase what is called the pill burden. You're taking, instead of having lunch or dinner, you're taking your pills, which is not a healthy and enjoyable way of no. living. <laughs> and you so. concur. 
I, I agree. And, you know, we spoke about maybe what we call polypharmacy, where you have all these medications. Remember, you take five or more medications, your risk of falling is through the roof. I, uh, the pravastatin is a lipid-lowering drug. Yes. Uh, in an older person, I, you know, 75, though, is not that old. Yeah. Still, it, it, if you've had a heart attack, it reduces your heart attack risk. If you've not had a heart attack, it doesn't do anything. And aspirin is the same thing. A baby aspirin, it may be for your heart. And that's what happens when people start taking too many medication. They cannot differentiate what is really the most important medication and what is not. I had a gentleman who was just tired of taking medication. He was on 10 pills. So what did he do? He stopped taking his blood pressure medications, unfortunately, and continued taking the vitamins. And, and then had a stroke. Absolutely. So uh, I would say the only thing is if there's a neuropathy that might be B B12 related, yes. you don't want to stop that. Yes. In this part of the country, we don't get enough sun. I think vitamin D3 is a decent option, and I take it. But uh, one can argue that the, the, the other part of the, of the year, you get enough. So my personal bias is D3, and I'd re forget the rest. The big studies, huge studies, women's study, mm -hmm. half of them were on multiple vitamins, the other half were, were not, and there was no difference in the group. So, Homer, I'll just add this to your vitamin D. I think it's good. So the number you need to treat to prevent one fall with vitamin D is just 15. 50? 15, one five. 15? Yes. So, so it's not very many. It's not many, so it's good to you take You like it. vitamin D. I like vitamin Me D. Me too. <laughs> Avocado oil, I, I think D does the fish oil equivalent. It's really the, the and I, the other thing that uh, I like is ground flaxseed because it, uh, it, it's a nice fiber for your colon, mm -hmm. and it makes your coat shiny, as they say, you know, if you're a horse. But I would eat avocado by itself instead <laughs> of taking it in a pill. Why would you eat avocado oil? Let's eat an avocado on Absolutely. your salad. Absolutely. 58-year-old man from Brookings Caller wants to know if the stress of a broken bone can cause insomnia, stomach problems, and depression. These symptoms began three weeks after breaking his wrist. I think it can. I you do know, too. I think it can. You know, if you have pain and you're not comfortable, you can have all these things. Yep, it can. Yeah, the, and uh, but you wonder, why did he fall and break his wrist? Yes. Is there another story behind the picture? Yes. yes. So then you want to find out more about what happened that comes in on the fall. And all those things, like he said, could be medication related. Stomach problems, are you taking too much of your pain medications, which can not just cause stomach problem, but can cause bleeding too. Depression can be induced by the sleeping pills, beta blockers, certain kinds of heart pills. Uh, you know, there's a lot of depression problems related to pills. 84-year-old woman, doctor suggested taking something for osteoporosis, a shot once a year. One, uh, don't, uh, you rec do you recommend this also? Well, I think you have to be taking in context. Why is the recommendation? Are you on steroids that can potentially increase your risk of osteoporosis, what is the context? So if a doctor recommends it, um, without getting the full story, it will be hard for me to say don't. So I think if the patient has some questions, have a frank discussion with your doctor, look at the risks and the benefits per what you have, and that would help with coming up with a good decision. So they don't have any long-term data on this as far as proof that it saves lives, or reduces death rate, or, or reduces fractures. Do they or do they not? Well, um, with regards, I don't, I'm not too sure on the data yet, but projecting clinically, if let's say you had a very bad COPD or you had rheumatoid arthritis and you had to be on steroids for high dose for a long time. It would be worth considering. It would be worth. And if you're 85 and other than your rheumatoid arthritis, you're pretty functional, you, it's worth considering. Because if you fracture the hip at that age, you know, right. the, the problem might be, might be a lot. I think they pushed it upon the elderly, though. They show these pictures of a young, healthy, straight back person, and then the next time they're, and then they're this. They're 80 years of age, and they look like that, and they go, well, you should take our pill. And that was the, 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 by, uh, the phosphonides, the, the biphosphonides. Yes. yes. And I, Phosphomax. It, yeah, the Phosphomax. Yeah. That's Most it. people. And I, 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 I refuse to prescribe it. it you know, and right now, we've, they've got it out five years, and they found that now they're having small fractures, and it isn't seeming to do what it was supposed to do. And we started them on pills that, <clears throat> that is not doing what it's supposed to do. You know? So I, I'm, I'm not a fan. 
except maybe the steroid yeah. case. Yeah. And the other thing important to prevent osteoporosis is you need to get your calcium and your vitamin D. There you there. go. <laughs> and? Exercise. Exercise is the most important, whether you do aerobics or walking or even Tai Chi, whatever improves. Yeah, right. That is the, those things would help. Well, I mean, if, if you look at the x-ray of a hip and you see the lines of the stress that goes through the hip and into the pelvis, you can just see the lines of the stress. Those are made by walking and, and putting stress on it. The bones are made by the exercise, the gravity, the, the, the work that we do in living and moving around. Yeah. If you just sit on that couch, those stress lines go away and the bones become soft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 81-year-old woman from Avon osteoporosis, what do you think about Prolia? It's the same question. Well, we're done. This has been great. These are wonderful questions. Any final words that either one of you want to well, um, I think that it will be important to remember that we have to keep moving. Don't neglect exercise. You can walk, you can bike, eat healthy, enjoy life. At any age. If you weren't exercising, if you start doing it at any age, it's always a good idea. And there are programs if you feel that you know you cannot walk outside, it's dangerous. There are places you can go. You can go even in the mall, walk have a develop a social circle where you can get people walking with you it's always helpful to keep moving see and I have a selfish question to find and I'd ask each one of you this very same question and that is <clears throat> we we'd like to to say that and we think that this television effort on our part this is the 14th year is helpful and of value we're trying our best to be unbiased to have the true full-time right answers as good as we can give it. And what's your take on that? Uh, what do you think the value of a show like this? Oh, I, I think it's immense. For example, look at the number of questions we had in today. And these are questions that most people relate to. And probably they might not be comfortable talking to their doctor, or maybe get, get the wrong information from friends, but we have a very good panel here. We can give them the right information. And this is broken down. This is not using big words. It's just going plain and simple and telling people what they have to. So I think it's great. I can do very little in my office and in my practice, but this reaches out to a lot of people. So I think it's, it's very phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And Fatima. I think there's, because of the social media, because of the information that's out there, there's just so much information out there, which a lot of time can be just anecdotal. My friend said this, my friend had a benefit from this medication, data sends you an article saying, you know, someplace two people got better with this medication. It's very hard for people to understand what is the right thing to do. Having a program like this helps them, knowing it from people who are dealing with that, to who are keeping current with what's going on in the world, to break it down for you in simple language that makes sense to you, and that is, the mo you know, what is logical, what they think is going to work, and I think that's what's beneficial. Thank you both. Thanks for Thanks having so much. us. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, from all of us on On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, an organization working with the state's health care community to improve the quality of cares as part of the Great Plains Quality and Innovation Network. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinical Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swiftle Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.